In this video we're going to spend some time going through the cam operations for turning these slugs of 3 inch aluminum round bar into these parts. And after we set up the toolpaths and cam, we'll flip to a shot of the actual machining using the toolpaths we set up. The chapters in this video will help you skip the boring parts. It turned into a long one, so sorry for that. For me, getting started in cam was overwhelming. With all the options of toolpaths and then more settings inside the toolpaths, it was like drinking from a fire hose and wondering how I'd ever figure all this out. In this video, we're going to cut through the confusion, and by the time we're done, you're going to feel confident jumping into any of these toolpaths, and you're going to have a really good idea of where to go and what to tweak to make them do exactly what you need them to do. I'm going to be working in the HSM Works CAM plugin for SolidWorks, which was actually developed by Autodesk, and those are the same people that make Fusion 360, so if you're working in Fusion, you'll be able to follow along and do all the same things you see here. You'll notice that the HSM Works plugin is pretty well identical to Fusion Cam. All the clicks are the same, the names of the toolpaths are the same, the settings are the same. There's a few little nuances that might be different and I'll try to point them out, but for all intents and purposes, Fusion Cam and HSM Works are virtually identical. So we designed this part and we want to machine it out of a 3 inch slug of aluminum round bar. Because it's round and difficult to hold in a vise, we're going to hold it in a lathe chuck that's bolted to a square plate, and that square plate is really easy to hold in a vise. I've heard people say that all a machinist does is take a chunk of material and remove everything that isn't the part. Okay, that might be simplifying the machinist's job, but when you hear me say things like stock or machine stock, you can think of that as being everything that isn't the part. And everything that is the part we'll refer to as the model or just the part. Before we can start creating toolpaths in CAM, the very first thing we've got to do is set up a job. This is where we'll define our stock size, shape, and orientation. Almost every vertical 3-axis mill has the X, Y, and Z axes in the same directions. When you're standing in front of the machine, this direction is generally always the positive X, this direction is generally always the positive Y, and this direction generally always positive Z. So let's go ahead and create a job up here where we can define these things. So when we hit job, the first thing that the system is looking for is it's asking us for what is the model. And if you remember, the model is the part we're going to machine. Because in this assembly, there's a bunch of stuff going on here. There's the base plate, there's the lathe chuck, there's the lathe chuck jaws, then there's the part. And, um, you know, HSM works in Fusion. They don't know what is the thing we're trying to machine. So what we're going to do is select the part or the model. And this is the thing that we want to machine. By default, um, it will put in a rectangular prism that is the smallest possible rectangular prism that fits our part inside of it. And in a lot of cases, this is what you're going to be using. You're going to be machining it from a square or a, a sort of square or rectangular prismatic uh, stock. But in this case, we're machining it from a cylindrical three inch round bar. So instead of relative size box, we want to select cylindrical. And great, now it's trying to put in a cylinder, and it's got it in there, but it's sort of in the wrong orientation. So in the dialog box underneath cylindrical, uh, we can click it and then click the side of the part, which is a cylinder. And now in this case, uh, the control is putting in a uh, the, the yellow shape that is the smallest possible cylinder that it's gonna, that's going to embody our part. Um, and this is great, this is a good start, but uh, the outside diameter of this part is 2.73 something, uh, and I know I'm trying to machine it from a 3 inch round bar. So if down here for radial stock offset, if I put 0.1, keep your eye on the model, if I put 0.1 here, it's going to offset the stock by 0.1 inches radially. And if I put 0.2, it'll offset it by 0.2. If I put 2 inches, it's going to try to offset it by 2 inches. And so this is where we have that control. But because the outside diameter of my part is a little bit of a funny dimension and that it's not something even and nice, it's like 2.73 something, I don't want to have to do the math exactly to tell the control how much to offset it. I just know that I'm machining this thing from a three inch round bar. So down here, I can click this use stock radius checkbox. And I know that the radius of a three inch round bar is one and a half. And when I do that, it populates the stock puts in uh, exactly a three inch round bar, which is great. Now I also, um, I wanna add a little bit of stock on top of the part. And so when down here under front side stock offset, I believe it's gonna add some material on top. I want a hundred thousandths on top of the stock. And there you go, it grew it by a hundred thousandths up here. And on the bottom, I wanna add half an inch. So we put in 0.5 and there we go. Now we're holding our stock in the lathe chuck jaws exactly the way we want it. Now, why do I put so much material down here? Well, it's because I want to actually, the way I like to machine when I'm using my lathe chuck is I want to machine down somewhere between the bottom of the part and the top of the jaw. So when I'm taking off stock 
from the top. You know, I want to be moving the end mill like this, and I want some room between the bottom of the part and the top of the jaw so that I don't crash the end mill into the jaw. And so, unfortunately, all this material down here is wasted material, but um, I like to do things this way. You can do it differently, but I find this is this technique ends up in the nicest possible wall finish. So if you're limited for material, you can sort of, you know, you could machine halfway, and then when you flip it, you can machine the other half, but you will see a line sort of where you've matched the, um, where you've matched the machining on the halfway plane or something. So this way does waste some material, but it ends up with a better finished product in my opinion. Anyway, um, this is all great. We've defined now the size of our stock, but we still have to define the orientation. You know, we talked about what is the positive X, Y, and Z. What are the positive X, Y, and Z axes? And we need to place um, the positive X, Y, and Z somewhere on this part that we can show the CNC machine where that is before we start machining. Because if we can't show the machine where our stock is located, you know, the machine might want to start machining up here. It might want to start machining over here. We somehow have to show the control where our part is sitting. And we do that with this triad, or you can call this the work coordinate offset. So in this case, I don't want it sitting sort of down here. I want it sitting on the bottom of the part or the bottom of the stock rather and right on the center axis of the part. So how do we do that? Down here in use stock and orientation we are going to click on use x and y axis and what we're going to do is right now we're going to show the control where the positive x axis is by selecting this plane. Now why did we do that? So this red arrow is positive x this green arrow is pointing in positive Y and the blue arrow is pointing in positive Z. When we select this plane for positive X, what we're telling the control is that we want the X axis to be perpendicular to this plane and positive in the direction away from it. Now the same is true for the Y axis. So we go down here and select Y. And then when we select this plane, we're telling the control that we want the Y axis to be perpendicular to this plane and positive in the direction away from it. And when we take a look at this triad, we can see that the triad is jumped to make that true. Red is X, which is positive in the direction away from this plane, and green is Y, which is positive in the direction away from this plane. And if those two things are true, then positive Z must be right up and down, which is the blue, and that is all looking very good, except that we want the, um, we want this, this center point to be located at the very bottom of the stock, not at the very top. So to tell the control that, we go here and we say the origin, yeah, we want it to be a stock box point, but we don't want it to be in the top center. We actually want it to be in the bottom center. So keep your eye on this triad when I select bottom center. We'll select it now, and you can see it just jumps right down, and it's sitting at the bottom of the stock, right in the very middle of the part, which is exactly what we want. So we are good on this job. We can select the check mark, and now we can move on and start creating toolpaths. Now, before we start machining, we've also got to show our mill CNC control where that origin or work coordinate offset is located in space. So the first thing we'll do is we'll find the Z plane. So, you know, we put the origin on the bottom surface of the part. And if we touch the top of the jaw that the stock is going to be sitting on, we'll show the machine where the uh, work coordinate offset in the Z plane is. And then we can run a probing routine on the cylinder to find the X and Y zero. So right in the center axis of that slug of raw material and we can show the control where that point is so uh, when we put all those things together you know we touch the top of the jaw we get the z and then when we run the probing routine on the x and the y we find the center in x and y and set all those to zero to show the control where that work coordinate offset is so that it knows how to run all the tool paths that we're about to program in CAM. Okay, great. So we set up our job, we put in our work coordinate offset, we showed our machine where that work coordinate offset was. And, and I don't know that I mentioned this explicitly, but if it isn't obvious yet that the, the work coordinate offset is just the point on the machine where all the axes x, y, and z, they all equal zero. So that's what we did by showing our machine where this point was, we probed surfaces and ended up showing it where everything equals zero. Uh, okay, great. So now we're ready to start putting on some tool paths to machine this thing. And this is where, for me anyway, uh, it was a little bit like drinking from a fire hose and that you have these tool paths and these tool paths to choose from. And it's like, my God, where do I start? How do I even begin to start doing what I want to do? And um, this, I think, is probably going to be the most important part of the video in clearing the fog of cam and machining in general if you're just getting started. But... Uh, 
toolpaths can be categorized into essentially two different categories. There is roughing or clearing, um, and then there's finishing. So the first thing you want to do when you start machining something is remove the maximum amount of material possible, get like the bulk shape. You can think of it essentially machining the part, but leaving like a 10,000th skin all around the part. And that's what a clearing operation does. Then you come in with a finishing toolpath and you just kind of kiss the surfaces to get a nicer surface finish and bring them to their final dimensions. And that's what you do. That's the strategy for every single part. You rough it or clear it, and then you go in and finish it. So um, if you're like me and mostly machine 2D parts, uh, which, and a 2D part is any part that has all, it just has to satisfy two things. All of the walls are vertical and all of the floors are flat or horizontal. So like, uh, this is a 2D part. That's an example of it. This is a 2D part here. All the floors are flat. All the walls are vertical everywhere on the part. You'll never find a wall that isn't vertical and you'll never find a floor that isn't totally flat or horizontal. Same is true for this. This is a 2D part, all flat floors, all vertical walls. All flat floors, all vertical walls. Same here. All the walls are vertical. All the floors are flat. Okay, I think you get the point. Uh, let's contrast that just quickly with 3D machine parts or something like this. You have like wavy surfaces. Um, you know, not all the walls are, are vertical. Not all the floors are, are flat. Here's another great example of a 3D part. Things are kind of waving here. So you'll need some 3D tool paths to make this. But the, the concept is the same. You're going to come in and rough out as much material you can with a clearing tool path or a roughing tool path. Then you're going to come in and finish it with a finishing tool path. And so if you're like me and machine mostly 2D parts, which are parts with the vertical walls and flat floors, you're going to need really only two tool paths. And the clearing tool path is going to be the 2D adaptive clearing tool path. The finishing tool path is going to be the 2D contour tool path. We're going to use those in this video and machining this part. We're also going to drill some holes. So, you know, in drilling, we're going to drill some holes. We're going to do some chamfering to like deburr these hard edges, but those are really easy tool paths. The only two you really need to focus on are 2D adaptive clearing and 2D contour. Um, 2D pocket, I've never used it. Facing you can to clear up, facing only clears off the top, like it decks off the top of your part to bring, you know, to remove all the, all the stock on top here. And you can use it. In this case, we're not going to, we're going to do the facing with the 2D adaptive clearing operation. 2D pocket, I've never used it. 2D slot, never used it. Thread, this is for thread milling. So like if you want to put some threads in here, which we're not going to do, but you know, you'll need that tool path. You come in with a thread mill. It just does a helix up the hole until there's threads. That's all it does. Uh, so if you want to do that, that's something, there's lots of videos out there on how to use this thing. It does just one thing very simply circular. Don't use it. Never used it. Bore, I've used it, but just really to experiment with it, I don't use bore. Trace, this is where, you know, you can engrave something or have the center of your tool trace a sketch that you draw or some text maybe that you have. Um, 2D chamfer, like I say, we're going to use this for deburring engrave. Don't worry about that one. This is kind of a rare one. Um, so you really only need two tool paths. And that, to me, when I realized that, that really cleared the fog because if you're machining a 2D part, just remember, all you really need is the 2D adaptive toolpath and the 2D contour toolpath for finishing. Like, take a look at this part. It looks like a pretty complicated little part, and the fixed ring was a little complicated, you know, and it's actually two parts. There's the left side, kind of a mirror image, and I have a video on how I machine this part. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested, but um, take a look at this. All I did was their adaptives and then their contours, and that's pretty much it. Like, let's do... Okay, there's this facing operation up here, but let's just not even select the facing operation. Let's just select the adaptives and the contours. Let's do a stock simulation. Okay, let's hit play. Let's speed it up a little bit. But so here's all the adaptive. It's clearing material, clearing material, clearing material. And then the contour just comes in and it kisses all the little edges and it brings this part uh, to final size with a nice surface finish. So everything else, because I know, you know, you see here, I didn't select everything, but everything else is like chamfering. So this is just deburring the part. This is taking off all the hard edges. And then there's drilling, spot drilling and drilling, which we're also going to do when we make that part. But these are all really, really easy. And here's some more adaptive and contour down here. I sort of don't remember why. It looks like these were for the holes. But you can see, like, all these are adaptives. These are adaptives. These are all the contours. And then you have just more adaptive and contours and there's yeah some chamfering some other things but look at all this it's all just adaptive and contouring so uh, if you can't tell already this is what i really wanted to drill home in this video because um 
that is all you really need to machine. Like if you're like me, 95% of your parts. Anything that's 2D, it's all you need to machine. Uh, and we're not going to do 3D milling, but the same is true for 3D milling. These two here, and they even separate it in 3D milling. These two here are clearing toolpaths. I've never used pocket clearing. I've only ever used adaptive clearing. And then here are finishing toolpaths. These are all those like fun tool paths you see machines running at trade shows or on Instagram or something. And they only remove the final 5 to 10% material left after roughing. There are only this many of them because nobody's figured out how to write an algorithm that'll generate the perfect tool path for every geometry. But that's only true for 3D milling. For parts with flat floors and vertical walls, we have figured out what the perfect tool paths are. And they're tool paths like the 2D adaptive clearing and 2D adaptive contour tool paths that we're going to be using. But that's kind of what separates a great programmer from somebody like me. These are people who know exactly which tool path to use for which geometries, how to contain them and they are able to bring a part to its final dimensions with the best possible surface finish. Okay, that's enough rambling. Let's go ahead and start doing what we discussed, which is we're going to rough it first, then we're going to come in with a finishing tool path to, um, to, to bring the part to get a nicer finish and to bring it to its final dimensions. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into 2D milling, surprise, surprise, adaptive clearing. And um, here's another important part is that all these tool paths, you know, there's, there's going to be different options and things you want to select, but they all have these tabs. And in all of these tabs, you're doing essentially the same thing. So here on the left, we have our tool tab, we have our geometry tab, heights tab, passes tab, and linking tab. So in any tool path, you will never see more than these five tabs. You'll sometimes see less, but you'll never see more than these five tabs. And in the tools tab, you're always going to talk about which tool you're going to use and how fast you're going to run it. In the geometry tab, you're always going to talk about the geometry you want to machine. So you'll be selecting faces and edges and holes, and you're going to be telling the system what you actually want to machine. In the heights tab, you're going to talk about how deep down you want to machine. So like if I select this ring, but I only want to machine halfway down the part, I can say that. I can say, don't go all the way to the bottom, or I can say only go to this point or this point or whatever. So in the heights tab, you're always going to be talking about how far down you want to machine. In the passes tab, you're going to talk about things like your step over and how hard you want to engage the part like here. This is something called optimal load, which is the step over, like how far into the material are you going to be machining with the side of the cutter? Uh, do you want to machine the height in multiple depths um, and things like that? And in the linking tab, you're going to always talk about how you want to link from one operation to the other. So, you know, do you want to plunge straight into the part? Do you want to start clearing with a helical ramp? What are the parameters of that helical ramp? How big is that helix? What's the pitch of that helix? What's There's all these options, but all those options are going to have to do with how you engage the part between linking moves. And that is it. Might seem like a lot, but it really isn't. You're going to see the way we start doing these tool paths. We're going to jump in. We're going to just select something and then jump out and see what we get. And we're going to look at what we get, see if we like it or don't. And then we can always jump back in and start editing and tweaking little things until we're happy. So, um, yeah, like I say, there's the tool path, geometry, heights, passes, and linking. So this is the 2D adaptive tool path. Now let's just jump out of it and let's go into 3D milling, for example. I'm going up and down. I'm just going to randomly click. Okay, where do we end up? Radial. Look at this. Tool tab, geometry tab, heights tab, passes tab, linking tab. Okay, let's try another one. This is for radial. Get out. 3D milling. Let's go to project. I've never even used this tool path, but here we go. Surprise, surprise. Tool, geometry, heights, passes, linking. But you can take some solace in knowing that um, you are doing all the same things in all of these tabs for every single tool path in HSM Works and Fusion. Okay. Now that's enough rambling. Let's actually, let's start putting on, um, let's start putting on some tool paths here. So yeah, let's start with the 2D milling, 2D adaptive clearing tool path. And uh, the first thing I want to do, like for my strategy, sorry, I'm getting out here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to clear the top off and I want to clear it with a spiral. I want to start on the outside and start spiraling in until all the material is clear. And then we're going to clear the outside of the part. So, you know, further down, we're going to clear the outside of the part down to about here. You know, we're going to chase around. Then we're going to clear the inside of the part. Uh, and all those things that I just said, we're going to do all of those with 2D adaptive operations because we're clearing, we're roughing. And it's a 2D part, so all I need is 2D adaptive. And that's what we're going to use. And then after that, we're going to come in with a finishing toolpath and clean up the skin that we left with the adaptive strategies. And then finally, we're going to drill the holes and we're going to deburr the part with drilling and some chamfering operations. But those are easy and you're going to see why. Okay. 
for real this time. 2D milling, 2D adaptive clearing. Let's go ahead and choose a tool. I'm gonna select my 3 8 3 flute aluminum end mill. That's what I like to use. It removes material relatively quickly on my little machine. Um, I always do 3000 RPM because that's my limit and I try to squeeze everything I can out of this little thing. So I always machine at 3000 RPM when I'm um, uh, trying to machine quickly with this tool. I go about two and a half thousandths inch per tooth or, or three thou feet per tooth here. And then all my lead-ins are about 20, 22. Oh, this one by default is slower. Let's go 20. All right, great. We're done. Oh shoot. We're done telling, uh, we're done talking about the speed of the end mill. Now that was our tool tab. Now let's go over to the geometry tab. And again, this is where we tell the system something about what shape we want to machine or what feature we want to machine. Let's just go ahead and in this model, this is where we're going to select what feature we want to machine. Now let's just go ahead and select this edge and let's get out of here. Let's accept this tool path and let's see what we get. And this is how I recommend you do it. Like jump into a tool path, select like one or two things just to get you out of that tool path um, and see what you get. Okay. So what are we getting here? We are, we're coming in with a helical ramp. We're going down with a ramp and then we're going out with the blue. Now what's nice is you can always do a stock simulation. So let's do a stock simulation and see what that actually means. Let's click play. Okay. That happened really fast. Let's slow it down a little so you can see it. So we're coming in with a helix, okay? And now we're going out. All right, we're doing something, but we're not doing what we want. What we actually wanna do is we wanna start from the outside and then we want to machine in. We don't wanna start with machining this cavity first. We wanna start from the outside of the part and work our way in, not the inside of the part and work our way out. So, okay, let's get out of this stock simulation. So let's go back into this tool path, hit edit. And right under here, we're in the geometries, geometries tab again. And right here, let's uncheck machine cavities because we don't want to start machining that cavity. Let's uncheck this machine cavity. Let's jump out and let's see what we get. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. We're starting on the outside of the part and then we're starting to spiral in until we come out. But wait a minute, we're not, we're not going all the way to the middle. We're stopping at this edge. And well, that's because we selected that edge in the geometries tab, um, meaning, you know, right here in this model box, we selected that edge. So it's only gonna machine up to that edge, which is making sense. Let's do a stock simulation and see what that looks like. All right, and it's looking it's looking pretty good. Like, the, you know, that's that's we're getting really close to what we want. We'll speed it up a little bit here. And we can see though that when it gets to the middle, it stops and leaves us this little puck. Well, that's not what we want. We wanna machine all the way to the middle. So uh, one little trick with the adaptive toolpath, I mean, I don't know if you can call it a trick, but that's we selected this edge here. Now we don't wanna come up to the edge. We wanna go all the way to the middle. And so let's just not select anything. Let's click here, let's delete it, get out of this toolpath and see how we're doing. We're spiraling in from the outside to the inside, which is exactly what we want. But we saw we have this problem now we're machining above the part. Well, no problem. Let's go to our heights tab which is where we talked about. This is gonna talk about how far down we wanna machine. These two options up here have to do with like clearance height and retract height. So these are, these are these two planes up here, and this is sort of where the tool retracts to between linking moves. These by default are generally set okay, like unless you have bolts and fixtures up here, you can increase these heights. So like, you know, you can increase this, the height of these planes so that when your tool is moving, it comes way up and over any fixtures. But let me get out of here because I want to undo those changes. You can hear all the motorcycles in my town right now. Okay. Um, so we're going to keep these two where they are. It's these two that we really carry about, the top and the bottom. And uh, as far as I know, unless I'm missing something, but I don't think I am, every tool path has a top height and a bottom height. So this is this is where you're telling the, the system where you actually wanna start machining and where you want to stop machining as far as heights go. So because we've, we this is our very first machining operation. So we have machine stock all the way to the stock top. Uh, so the top is gonna be from our stock top. We wanna machine, right? And this, all the fields down here are offsets from these planes. So. If you want to machine actually a little bit above the stock top, you can put in a positive value here. If you want to start machining a little bit below it, you put a negative value. And then the bottom is, you know, how far down do we want to machine? How far down this way do we want to machine? And because we want to machine only to the very top of the part, we can say we want to machine from the top. Like the bottom of our machining, we want it actually to be the top of our, um, of our part. Actually, sorry, model top. 
is going to be the bottom of our machining. So the model is the part. So we want our machine to go all the way down to the top of the part in this case. Let's click OK and see what that does. All right, great. So it really dropped down, but take a look here from the side. We still have a little bit of space. It didn't drop right down to our model top. And the reason for that is because we're using a 2D adaptive operation. And like we discussed, a 2D operation, adaptive operation is a roughing strategy. So by default, it's gonna leave you a skin both radially and axially, but in this case, it's just like an axial skin. It's gonna leave you a little bit of skin to come in later and fix with a finishing toolpath. But in this case, I don't wanna come in later with a finishing toolpath. I'm okay just roughing the top of this part and coming right down to the model. So I go, this is actually in the passes tab. And the passes tab, look here, stock to leave. It's leaving uh, 20 thousandths radially and it's leaving um, and it's leaving 20 thousandths axially. So I don't want to leave actually any stock in this operation. Let's uncheck it, let's hit the check mark, and let's see and go ahead and see what we get. All right, now you can see it really dropped that machining right down to the top surface of the part. And it's pretty much doing exactly what we want it to do. And the only other thing, and I can just tell that this step over is a little bit too aggressive for my machine. You know, we have a hundred thousandths of stock above the part. I'm gonna jump back in. And when we go to the passes tab, which is the tab that we the tab that we sort of generally talk about how aggressive we're machining, instead of a step over or um, fusion and HSM works call this an optimal load, it specifies the amount of engagement the adaptive strategies should maintain. So that's like the width. If you look at these two graphics here, you can see like that's the width of the pass that the end mill is going to take. And unfortunately, I'm only going to do like 60 thousandths here. I could probably push it a little bit, but I'm going to stick to 60. I want to be safe. I don't want to mess anything up. I'm just shooting for success here. And now you can tell, look, we have a finer spiral. Well, great. It looks like we are getting exactly what we want. Let's do a quick stock simulation to make sure that we are in fact getting what we want. And great. There you go, we can speed it up a little, but it's essentially spiraling all the way in. We can see these little black lines which show us, yeah, we're going right down to the top of our part. And yeah, there's the bore in the middle, but we are just machining off this skin. Okay, I'm happy with that. Let's go over to the machine and see what this looks like on the mill. Even pay attention to the entry position. Like every single little thing that we programmed in CAM is exactly what we get on the mill. Okay, great. So we've machined all the stock off the top and now we want to come in and remove the material beside the part. So sort of all along the perimeter of the part. And again, we're going to do that with 2D milling, 2D adaptive clearing. And what is nice is if you're creating another 2D adaptive operation, it, it keeps the tool from the last operation and it keeps all the feeds and the speeds from the last operation, which we're going to keep the same. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the geometries tab now. Now we want to come in and machine from the outside in, so we're going to uncheck machine cavities. We don't want to sort of start with a cavity. You can see the difference here in machine cavities. On the left, you're spiraling in and clearing out. And on the right, you're, you're not spiraling in, you're just engaging from the outside of the part and working your way in. So that's what we want to do. So we're going to uncheck machine cavities to kind of uh, confirm that condition. So we uncheck machine cavities. Now we go here, we go ahead and select this edge. And let's just accept the toolpath and see what we get. All right, and it looks like we are doing the kind of thing we want. We're coming in from the outside, clearing material, and then we're leaving. But I want to go in, okay, clear problem. We're obviously not machining down far enough. We want to machine, in this case, a little bit past the bottom. So we got to change that in our heights tab. And then I also see here, I'm taking all of that stock with one step over. So I want to go, let's jump back into the toolpath. And um, first, let's go, you know what, let's go to our heights tab first. Let's make that change. This time, we want to machine past the bottom of this surface. So back down here for our top and bottom, this is where we're going to tell the machine again where, where the top of our machining starts and where the bottom of the machining is. And this time, we're not going to machine from the stock top because in the previous operation, we removed the stock. There's nothing there to remove. So we might as well go ahead and start from the model top. Then for the bottom, I want to say from model bottom, and now you see it goes right down to the model bottom, but I actually want to machine a little bit past it. I'm going to machine 50 thousandths past, which is just, so we want to go 50 thousandths lower. So we have to put a negative sign. So we put minus 50 thousandths. And when we get out, you see this tab, it jumps down. So we're going to machine from this point and we're going to machine all the way down. So let's get out of the, the toolpath and see what we get. 
Awesome. Okay. We can see it move down. But now, like I say, I want to make sure my step over is right. I think I'm taking too big of a step over here. And I also, I don't think I want to come right down to the bottom of the part and start machining. I think I want to take this in two different steps. I want to come down to about the halfway point. Then I want to machine around the part. Then I want to drop down and take a second pass. So sort of do the machining in two height steps. One about halfway, and then one all the way to the bottom. So let's first to make sure that our, um, let's go to our passes tab to make sure we're not taking too much material. And here we go. By default, um, this operation with this tool goes to 150 thousandths radial step over or optimal load. I'm going to change this to 50 thousandths. It was 60 last time, but we were only removing 100 thou, so 0.1 depth. Now we're removing a little more, so I'll go a little bit easier here. Um, and you know what, let's just jump out of that and see what we get. Okay, you can see it's taking passes now. There's, it's sort of ramping in. It's not doing it all in one shot, which is great. That's what we want. But we also want to machine this thing in multiple depths. We don't want to machine it just in one single depth. So we haven't done this yet, but let's jump into adaptive. And in the passes tab, where we talk about sort of how aggressively we are machining, we defined our optimal load here. Now we want to say we want to use multiple depths to clear the part. So now we have to tell the program a little bit about, you know, how finely do we want to remove material. I want to go, um, I'll do 0.4. So the, my maximum depth is going to be 0.4. And then that's, that's as hard as I want to machine for depth. So here we go. Let's see what we got. Okay. Now we get sort of two, we get sort of two, uh, two machining paths, one here and one a little bit lower. Now this is, this is pretty close to what we want, but looking at this to me, uh, you know, this distance looks a lot bigger than this distance. And what's happening here is HSM works and fusion. They're saying, okay, well you told me 0.4. So what it's doing is it's machining down 0.4 inches. And then for the second one, it just machines whatever is left, right? Uh, but in my case, I'd like to use even step downs. I, I want it to sort of cut this thing in half instead of do 0.4 with one and then less than 0.4 with the other one. So you can go back into the tool path. And if you ran that, it would be fine, but it's nice to keep kind of even tool pressure. And so under multiple depths, right here, it says use even step downs. And when we check that, we get out, we say, okay. And now it's looking more even for us, right? From here, the distance from here to here is the same as the distance from here to here. Great. So that is pretty close to what we want, but there's one more thing I'm looking at here and you see where the tool engages. It's getting really close to this jaw and looking at it, it's probably going to be okay. But I want to show you one more cool thing about these tool passes. You can also specify where they engage the part. So in this case, I want it to engage, you know, either here or here or here. So sort of like the furthest distance away from any jaws, just to make sure that when it comes in and when it leaves, it's not going to get too close to like this edge or something like that. So um, let's go back to our CAD environment here. I'm going to select this surface and say, I want to start a sketch. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take a point and I'm going to put a point right there on the side of the part. Okay, great. Let's get out now. Let's go back to the cam environment. And we go back to our adaptive. We click edit. And then in our linking tab, which is the tab that generally talks about how we engage the part between operations, there's some here called entry positions. And when we click entry positions, it gives us this dialog box where I can go in and sort of select that point. Okay, it's hard to see for you maybe because it's hidden under this blue edge. But you see, how oh, there you go, it selects orange kind of. I can select that point and then that point one in my sketch number four appears down here. I'll accept the tool path. And then take a look at what it does. Everything is the same about the toolpath except the entry positions, which is really nice. And now let's run a stock simulation and sort of see what that gives us. And if I select both of the toolpaths in my tree and then select stock simulation, it'll give me a simulation for both of them. So let's hit play. All right, great. We've already seen that. So let's speed that. Okay. You know, I jumped a little too fast there, but great. Here we go. We can see um, this is a stock simulation from our first two toolpaths. And the second tool path here, look at these facets. See how there's like kind of these edges? Well, pay attention to this when we're machining, uh, when we flip to a shot of the machining, because a 2D adaptive strategy is not a finishing strategy. So it doesn't really focus its attention on nice wall finishes. That's why we're going to come back in with the contour operation and clean these up. But as we can see here, by default, it's left us a little bit of skin to clean up uh, later with a finishing tool path. 
Um, so this is all looking pretty good. Let's get out of the stock simulation and I'm just gonna go back into this adaptive and I'm gonna go to the stock to leave. We saw that radially, so when I say radially, that's like material beside the cutter. When I say axially, I mean material under the cutter or under the end mill. So when we go to our passes tab where our stock to leave settings are, I do really like that it's leaving us radial stock because I want to come back in and clean up material beside the cutter with the 2D contour operation. But in the heights tab here, we told it to machine 50 thousandths past the bottom. So if here we leave 20 thousandths of axial stock, it's only going to machine 30, which is not what I want. So I want to change this one to zero. And this one at 20 is fine, but I like to leave 10 thousandths of stock. Um, just a personal preference thing. We'll hit OK. Let's do one more stock simulation. I'm only selecting that second operation now, so we're not gonna see a stock simulation of the first, but there you go, we're cleaning up around the part. Great, and look where we're engaging. We're engaging over here between the jaws. So now we're gonna come down, machine the second slice, and we're done. All right, so let's flip to a shot of the actual machining. And our entry position is right between those two jaws, just like we specified in our linking tab. And we're spiraling in from the outside to the inside because we unchecked machine cavities and we're sort of working our way in. And same, there's now the second level, a little bit of camera fumbling there, but we're machining that second depth now because we're doing multiple depths. But pay attention to the surface finish on the outside of the cylinder. Just like we saw in the stock simulation, you have that sort of stepped edge on the outside of the cylinder and it's not perfectly smooth. And this is the surface finish that a 2D adaptive clearing operation leaves on curved surfaces because it isn't a finishing toolpath. It's just focusing its energy on removing as much material as possible. And so that's what you have to come in and clean up with a finishing toolpath. In our case, we're going to use a 2D contour, but you could use any finishing toolpath and finishing toolpaths don't leave that sort of faceted surface finish. All right, great. So we've got our two operations that got us to that point. Now we want to go ahead and remove uh, material from the middle, this bore. So again, surprise, surprise, we're going to go 2D milling, 2D adaptive clearing operation. It's keeping our same tool, 3H3 fluid aluminum end mill, and all of our feeds and speeds from the previous operations, which is what we want to use. Now we'll go over to our geometries tab, and we're going to select this inside edge because now we want to come in from the middle and we do want to machine this cavity. We want to sort of do a helical ramp until we get low enough and then start clearing outwards in this cavity here. So we selected that model. We're gonna keep machine cavities checked because just like on the left graphic there, we want a helical ramp in and start machining out, but we wanna machine a cavity. And um, let's go into our heights tab now and let's say our machining, we wanna start not from the stock top, we want to go from the model top and then we want to machine this time we're going to hit from selection because I want to machine a little bit below this edge right here or a little bit below this surface here. So I'm going to select that surface and say I want to go minus 50 thousandths past that surface and that is all good there. Let's jump out and sort of see what we have. Okay, great. Looks like we are getting what we want. We're starting with a helical ramp. We're working our way in to a point that is, you know, 50 thousandths below this surface. But remember, we have to go in and check our stock to leave because by default, 2D Adaptive is going to leave us some stock there. So, but this is, you know, we're doing what we want there. So let's go in, let's edit it. Now let's go to our uh, passes tab and let's uncheck or let's hit zero for stock to leave axially because we do want to go this whole 50 thousandths down. We don't only want to go 30 by having 20 thousand stock to leave here. So we do like the radial stock to leave because we're going to have to come back in and clean it up with a contour operation. But again, I like doing 10 thousand stock to leave. Uh, so that's all good. And then let's go to our linking tab. And by default, it looks like HSM works in Fusion. They default the, the, the parameters of the helix. So when we sort of ramp in, it's a two degree helix. Um, I like to go one on my little machine. It's not terribly rigid. If you do have a machine that's more rigid, you could go more than two degrees, but I am going to want to step down at one degree and let's click OK. So you see how it is now a finer spiral. That's good. That's what I want. That's how I change the helix. But what I don't like is that up here when I'm starting to machine the part, look at all this air I'm cutting. I'm cutting air up here for quite a while. I want to start this helix a little bit further down. So let's go back into our adaptive. Let's go edit. Go to our linking tab again. And here, instead of starting a hundred thousandths above the part, I want to start, we'll change this to 30 thousandths. And when we accept that, now you can see we're cutting air for, you know, we're 
we're starting really much closer to the top of the part. And again, for me, this step over looks a little big. I'm going to go back in. You see how much time I'm spending jumping in and out? I like to not change too many things at the same time. And as you get a better handle of this, you can kind of spend, you know, you can do this less and less. But it's, uh, it's nice to sort of demonstrate what's going on. And we're going to change this from 150 to 50 thousands. Let's hit OK. And now we can see, great, we're going with a helical ramp and these steps are a little bit finer. So this is it, this is what I want. I don't care about any entry positions here because I'm going in the middle of the part. There's no jaws or anything in the way. Let's go ahead, um, let's go over to the mill and see how that looks. So here's the tail end of that last 2D adaptive operation. And we go above the part, 30 thousandths, and start our helical ramp into the part. And we're gonna helical ramp into the part all the way until we reach the point that's 50 thousandths below that selected surface we defined in our heights tab. And when we get there, we start working our way out until we reach that uh, bore, or until there's only 10,000 stock to leave on that bore, and then the toolpath will finish. Okay, great. So we've got the machining to this point. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in with the same tool, the 3 8 end mill, and we're gonna clean up these sort of facets. And this time, we're gonna switch tool paths. Remember, these are our roughing strategies, so we've roughed out all that material, or cleared out roughing or clearing strategy. Um, and now we're gonna go in, and we're gonna do a 2D contour operation, which is gonna be the finishing tool path we use 99% of the time when machining 2D parts, and when cleaning up roughed surfaces with 2D parts. So all these feeds and speeds, we're gonna keep these the same. So we're gonna go over to the geometries tab and we are going to select this outside ring. Now, um, this arrow, this is really important. Um, when we selected this ring, this time it put this arrow on the inside, which means this is the, the side and direction of that ring that the end mill is gonna be moving in, which we don't want. We don't want it cutting the inside, we actually want it cutting the outside. So we go over here and with this ring selected, we're only gonna use one ring here, but if you have multiple, you select the ring that has the arrow on the wrong side, you select the, the edge that has the arrow on the wrong side, you hit reverse and it flips the arrow to the other side. It will also move the other way to maintain that climb milling condition. All right, great, so we selected that. Let's just jump out of it and see what we get. Okay, and uh, we can see here, it's uh, it's given us something, but it is cleaning up the perimeter of the part, which is what we want, but it's too high. So all the same, just like we were doing in the adaptive, let's go in, we hit edit, and we're gonna go over to our heights tab. And this time we go, we're happy with the top of the machining being the stock top, but the bottom, we want it to be the model bottom. And when we do that, we select okay, Awesome, that's great, it's dropped it down. But again, as we always do, I want to uh, I want to drop this down another 50 thousandths just so that we're cutting a little bit below it and we're giving ourselves a little bit of forgiveness when we flip the part. So we go back to the Heights tab and for model bottom, minus 50 thousandths. We can see the plane moves down and we select it and we hit okay. Now there is uh, there's one more thing that I don't like about this. So we can see here our the red line is our tool entering and we start machining this way. And as we come around the other side, the yellow line is the tool leaving. And so it engages and disengages the part at the exact same point. So what can happen is you can actually have a line uh, on your part right here where the end mill engages and I guess disengages the part. But there's something called the finishing overlap where we can go in and right here, this finishing overlap, see here, the finishing overlap is the distance that the tool passes beyond the entry point before leading out. So if we enter, I usually do about 50 thousandths here, but let's just enter 50 thousandths and see what we get. All right, and you see what's happening here. In this case, we have this sort of flat spot and it's exactly 50 thousandths long. Well, it's not flat, it's rounded to contour the piece, but uh, Pretty much the end mill goes past the starting point by a little bit before leaving, just to kind of make that look as seamless as possible. And another thing we can do is uh, if we don't like where it is engaging the part because it's too close to this jaw, just like we saw in the adaptive, we can move this with an entry position. So we go into our contour again, and I think it's in the linking tab. And so here we have entry positions right here. And again, that's hard to see, but there's a dot on a sketch or a point on a sketch here. We'll select it. We'll hit okay. And then we see everything is the same. We still have our finishing overlap and all that, but we have it in the spot, exactly in the spot that we want it. And now we're just gonna do the same thing for the inside bore. So I'll run through it quickly here. 2D milling, 2D contour. It's keeping our tool and feeds and speeds the same. We go over to the geometries tab. We select that, uh, that ring. This time it's put the arrow on the right side, so that's great. 
we'll go over to the heights tab and this time the the the, the top of the machining yet yeah, we want it at the model top and then in our machining bottom we want to put from selection and now we're going to select this bottom surface and I want to go 50 thousandths below it again 50 thousandths all right and without getting out of it let's go over to the passes tab and um, let's uh, put in our finishing overlap now that we know what we're doing we know what this is going to do oh, no we want 50 thousandths again let's click OK and see what we get all right great so we have our uh, sort of where we come in and where we exit there's our finishing overlap and it is below the surface we can see if we take a section we are 50 thousandths below the surface which is great that's exactly what we want so let's go over to the stock simulation see what we get all right so it looks a lot like what we had before except this time we are uh, we got rid of those facets see this is a nice smooth surface the 2d contour is a finishing toolpath so we should get rid of any kind of imperfections in the surface here so let's go over to the mill and uh, kind of see what we get with this contour so the end mill starts engaging a part between the jaws on the left side of the piece like we specified and look it's machining away those surface imperfections those facets we will have a better look as it comes around here what's in front of the end mill you know you've got those imperfections and it's machining them off which is really nice we'll go straight into the second 2d contour operation which starts on the right side sort of on the inside of the part comes all the way around to our 50 thou finishing overlap and leaves so we're almost done with this side all we've got left to do is like we said we want to deburr those edges and we need to put in these holes and to put in the holes we're actually going to use a chamfer mill so we're going to use the same tool to do both of those things now let's start with the deburring and what we're going to do is we're going to go 2d milling this time we're going to do the 2d chamfer operation this is something we haven't used yet we're going to have to switch tools so we go to our tool library and then i select my tool number three which is a 3 8 two flute 45 degree chamfer mill or a 90 degree chamfer mill whatever you want to however you want to look at it but it looks like this so we're going to select it for feeds and speeds now we're cutting a little slower because this is a, a, a two flute but I'm going one and a half thousandths per inch and we're going to go over to the geometries tab now and we're going to select our two edges again we have this arrow it's on the wrong side so I'm going to reverse it here and then I'm going to select the inside ring and this time the arrow happens to be on the right side but again by selecting the ring and hitting reverse you always have control independently of the arrows that you want to reverse um, on each ring all right i'm just pausing the video quickly here because as i'm editing this i'm, I'm noticing i haven't explained something is uh, here you can see we selected two rings in the same chamfer feature but prior to this in both adaptives and both contours we did the outside of the ring in an adaptive strategy then we entered a new adaptive strategy to do the inside and the same is true for the two contour paths after that we have a contour for the outside then we have a contour for the inside so why in this case are we putting both chamfers in the same chamfering operation well the answer to that is that generally speaking when the heights of your features are different they need to be in different uh, tool paths so when we were doing our adaptives and and contours for the outside and inside of the ring we wanted to machine to different heights so we actually had to separate them into different tool paths but here because we're chamfering Kind of edges on the same surface we can keep them both uh, within the same toolpath all right in the heights tab i find the chamfer tool does a really good job of selecting all the right heights for anything i want to chamfer so with with chamfering i really never mess with the heights tab this all looks good and then here in the passes tab what i should have done is uh, i really only mess with two things here this is the size of the chamfer so this uh we're going to do at um, 20 thousandths maybe 25 thousandths and uh, here you'll see in the video of the actual machining, I forgot to change this. Now, what is this? This is uh, the chamfer tip offset. And this is how far below the chamfer surface the, the, the tip sort of sits. And a chamfering tool, especially on a machine with low RPM, will always work best when you put that tip as far down below that chamfer surface as you can because the tool is sort of moving at a faster speed. I hope that makes sense. But um, And you know what? I'll show you because I actually, in the video, I forget to do it. So let's just accept this. We take a look at our uh, chamfering operations. And again, everything looks good, but we have these entry points that there, there's no finishing overlap. Uh, and that's true for both the inside and the outside. So let's go in and change the finishing overlap, which, you know, we saw the finishing overlap in the 2D contour operation, but it also exists inside the, um, the chamfer operation. And it's right here. And for this, I also like to put 50 thousandths. Let's click OK. 
and you can see now it's added that little bit of overlap, both on the outside ring and on the inside ring. All right, let's jump over to the mill and see what this ends up looking like. The machine's going to start putting a chamfer on the inside ring and then move to the outside. But remember a moment ago where we said that I forgot to increase the chamfer tip offset? Well, take a look at how close the tip of this chamfer tool is to the very top surface. Now, uh, it's leaving kind of fuzzy burrs around the edge, and that's why. So we're going to make that correction in HSM Works where we can drop that tip down, and you're going to see that those burrs are going to go away. Let's go ahead and fix that sort of chamfer tip offset that we missed the first time. Let's edit this. And this time, instead of having the tip of the chamfer be only 40 thousandths, I'm going to have it be uh, a full 100 thousandths below the surface. With that change done, let's go over to the mill and uh, kind of take a look and see what's different. See how much further down below the top surface the tip of the tool is sitting? That's the consequence of increasing that chamfer tip offset. All right, with those chamfers in, let's go ahead and spot our holes. Now, I don't use very good drills. If, if you've got a nice drill, you, you probably, I mean, you don't really have to spot, especially in aluminum, you don't have to spot drill. They're really super straight and um, high quality tools. But in my case, I use some pretty cheap and dirty Canadian Tire or Harbor Freight style drills that none of them are straight. You can go through the whole pack and you won't find a straight drill bit. So what I like to do is use the same chamfer tool, this 90 degree 3 8 uh, chamfer tool to do a little bit of spot drilling. So the way we do that, uh, we go to drilling, drill. Okay, great. I've got my tool number three, which is my chamfer tool selected. That's great. That's what I want. Um, pay close attention in your, in your uh, feeds and speeds here, your plunge speed. This is really important. I like to plunge a drill at around uh, 10 inches per minute especially when I'm just spotting. Um, we'll select our holes here. We go over to the geometries tab to select the holes. Now remember, we're just spotting. I don't really want to do any drilling here. I just want to touch the surface to put a nice kind of divot in all three of these positions. So we'll go over to the heights tab. And here, uh, you know, we want to start the machining at the hole top. I like to put the model top because it's what I'm used to, but the hole top is the same. This is kind of just a, a mental thing for me. And uh, for the hole bottom, I'm also going to select the... Um, the model top, but this time I want to go 50 thousandths past it. So let's click OK. And here we get this warning that's telling us we're not using a drill for a drilling operation. And that's true. We're using our 45 degree chamfer mill. But in this case, we want that. It's all right. So we select yes. Let's go over to the machine and see what it looks like. We come down and machine those three spot faces, which are all at 50 thousandths depth, just like we specified in the heights tab. The spot drills are in. Now you've got to go in with a real drill and actually drill these holes all the way through. So we go back to drilling. We're going to go drill. And this time we're going to change our tool from the chamfer mill. And we're going to select the, uh, the actual drill, which I always keep as my tool number eight. We're going to select it. And then here, again, pay attention to your plunge speed. See, 40 inches per minute. I should change the defaults because I like to plunge at 10 inches per minute. We're going to go over to the geometries tab where we can select our holes. And in the same way, we're going to select all three. And then this time in the heights tab, I want the top to be from the hole top or the model top. It's all the same. I like to select model top. Then for the whole bottom, we're going to select um, from the model bottom. But uh, something worth noting here is you see that blue ring? That's kind of where the shoulder of the drill is going to come to. And I want that to go through the bottom, actually. I don't want it to stop where the tip exits the bottom, which by default, HSM Works is controlling the position of the tip of the bottom of the drill. And because we want to bring the whole width of the drill to the bottom, when you select drill tip breakthrough bottom, keep your eye on that blue kind of circle contour. When I click drill tip breakthrough bottom, it moves down. The tip moves down so that the tip... Uh, penetrates the bottom until just the uh, the shoulder is kind of exposing itself from the bottom of the part. But just to be safe, I want to go a little bit deeper here. And so that's what we're going to do is this breakthrough depth. We're going to add, I don't know, let's add another hundred thousandths or so. And when we do that, you can see both the shoulder of the drill and the tip break through the bottom, which is exactly what we want. Now, one more thing in the passes tab, uh, instead of doing drilling, wrap it out. I like doing deep drilling, full retract, because this gives you the ability to peck drill. And every time the drill retracts, it retracts up above the top surface. I like my peck depth to be, uh, again, a hundred thousandths. And now let's head back over to the machine and see what that looks like. I like to put a little bit of cutting fluid on the holes for a nicer finish, but you can see the mills going around and peck drilling those holes till it gets to final depth. And those spot faces are really helping us make sure that that drill enters at the right spot and keeps going straight. 
So for this operation, we're done. There's no more material we can remove from this side, so let's go ahead and flip the part around to finish the other side. Before we can start adding toolpaths, we've got to create another job because we've changed the orientation of the part. The z-axis is now pointing the complete opposite direction and we've got lots of stock to machine off the top, which last time was the bottom. We define all those things again like we did the first time we created the job and we can start adding our toolpaths. And this is where I'm sort of going to stop going step by step because we're not doing anything new on this side. We're going to put in an adaptive operation to clear off the top, just like we did the first time. Then we're going to run another 2D adaptive clearing operation with a helical entry to clear out the bore, just like we did the first time. Then finish by cleaning up the inside walls with a 2D contour operation, just like we did the first time. The only thing I want to show here that's a little different is the geometry tab of the 2D adaptive and contour operations. This time we've got these semicircular holes on this edge, so we can't select just the circular part of the geometry without selecting the holes too. Well, the good news is that you can select sketches instead of edges in the Geometries tab. So I made this sketch of a circle that has the same diameter as the bore, and we select it instead of the edge. Everything else is the same. Let's go over to the mill and take a look at those last three toolpaths. We start with the first 2D adaptive operation, clearing off all the stock from the top in multiple depths, just like we did the first time. So we're running the same toolpath, but we're running it twice at different machining depths, and this is really just because my little machine can't handle having to remove it all in one depth. Then we come in and rough the material out of the bore with another 2D adaptive operation. The end mill ramps into the aluminum before it starts sort of spiraling out to that circular sketch we selected in the geometry tab. Then we go straight into the 2D contour operation, which again, cleans up those facets and imperfections that we left with the adaptive operation. And that's it, the part's done. This video has run longer than I was aiming for, so if you're still with me, I hope it was helpful. If you're just getting started, I hope I helped clear some of the fog of all this cam and toolpath stuff. The key takeaways I wish I knew when I got started were knowing that all the tabs in every single HSM Works and Fusion Cam toolpath are the same. They're always the speeds, geometries, heights, passes, and linking tabs. There's never more tabs in any given toolpath, and they're always used for the same things. That paired with knowing that I only needed two main toolpaths, the 2D Adaptive and 2D Contour toolpaths, to machine 99% of my parts really boosted my confidence and understanding in being able to program and machine all kinds of stuff. And the goal of this video was to try to give you the same confidence, so I hope I've been able to do that. Have a good one, guys. See you in the next one.